Robert Lay, German, Law, the 15th of February 1890 to the 25th of October 1945, was a German politician during the Nazi era who headed the German Labor Front from 1933 to 1945. He committed suicide while awaiting trial at Nuremberg for war crimes. Topic: Early life. Ley was born in Niederbreidenbach now a part of Numbrecht in the Rhine province, the seventh of eleven children of a heavily indebted farmer, Friedrich Ley, and his wife Emily Wald. He studied chemistry at the universities of Jena, Bonn, and Münster. He volunteered for the army on the outbreak of World War I in 1914 and spent two years in the artillery before training as an aerial artillery spotter with Field Artillery Detachment 202. In July 1917 his aircraft was shot down over France and he was taken prisoner. It has been suggested that he suffered a traumatic brain injury in the crash. For the rest of his life he spoke with a stammer and suffered bouts of erratic behavior, aggravated by heavy drinking. After the war Lay returned to university, gaining a doctorate in 1920. He was employed as a food chemist by a branch of the giant IG Farben company, based in Leverkusen in the Ruhr. Enraged by the French occupation of the Ruhr in 1924, Ley became an ultra-nationalist and joined the Nazi party soon after reading Adolf Hitler's speech at his trial following the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich. By 1925 he was Gauleiter of the Southern Rhineland district and editor of a virulently anti-Semitic Nazi newspaper, the Westdeutsche Beobachter. Ley proved unswervingly loyal to Hitler, which led the party leader to ignore complaints about his arrogance, incompetence and drunkenness. Labor front head In 1934, Ley was brought to the Nazi Party's Munich headquarters to take over as head of the party organization Reichsorganisationsleiter following the murder of Gregor Strasser in the Night of the Long Knives. Ley's impoverished upbringing and his experience as head of the largely working-class Ruhr Party region meant that he was sympathetic to those elements in the party who were open to socialism, which Hitler opposed, but he always sided with Hitler in inner party disputes. This helped him survive the hostility of other party officials such as the party treasurer, Franz Xaver Schwartz, who regarded him as a drunken incompetent. When Hitler became chancellor in January 1933, Ley accompanied him to Berlin. In April, when the trade union movement was taken over by the state, Hitler appointed him head of the German Labour Front Deutsche Arbeitsfront, DOF. The DOF took over the existing Nazi trade union formation, the National Socialist Factory Cell Organization Nationalsozialistische Betriebsellen Organization, NSBO, as well as the main trade union federation. But Ley's lack of administrative ability meant that the NSBO leader, Reinhold Mucho, a member of the socialist wing of the Nazi party, soon became the dominant figure in the DOF, overshadowing Ley. Mucho began a purge of the DOF administration, rooting out ex-social Democrats and ex-communists and placing his own militants in their place. The NSBO cells continued to agitate in the factories on issues of wages and conditions, annoying the employers, who soon complained to Hitler and other Nazi leaders that the DOF was as bad as the communists had been. Hitler had no sympathy with the syndicalist tendencies of the NSBO, and in January 1934 a new law for the ordering of national labor effectively suppressed independent working-class factory organizations, even Nazi ones, and put questions of wages and conditions in the hands of the trustees of labor Treuhander der Arbeit, dominated by the employers. At the same time Mucho was purged and Ley's control over the DOF re-established. The NSBO was completely suppressed and the DOF became little more than an arm of the state for the more efficient deployment and disciplining of labor to serve the needs of the regime, particularly its massive expansion of the arms industry. Once his power was established, Ley began to abuse it in a way that was conspicuous even by the standards of the Nazi regime. On top of his generous salaries as DOF head, Reichsorganisationsleiter, and Reichstag deputy, he pocketed the large profits of the Westdeutsche Beobachter, and freely embezzled DOF funds for his personal use. By 1938 he owned a luxurious estate near Cologne, a string of villas in other cities, a fleet of cars, a private railway carriage and a large art collection. He increasingly devoted his time to womanizing and heavy drinking, both of which often led to embarrassing scenes in public. 
On the 29th of December 1942, his second wife Ing, 1916 to 1942, shot herself after a drunken brawl. Lay's subordinates took their lead from him, and the DOF became a notorious center of corruption, all paid for with the compulsory dues paid by German workers. One historian says, the DOF quickly began to gain a reputation as perhaps the most corrupt of all the major institutions of the Third Reich. For this, Lay himself had to shoulder a large part of the blame. <laughs> <laughs> Strength through joy Hitler and Ley were aware that the suppression of the trade unions and the prevention of wage increases by the trustees of labor system, when coupled with their relentless demands for increased productivity to hasten German rearmament, created a real risk of working class discontent. In November 1933, as a means of preventing labor disaffection, the DOF established strength through joy Kraft Deutsch Freude, KDF, to provide a range of benefits and amenities to the German working class and their families. These included subsidized holidays both at resorts across Germany and in safe countries abroad, particularly Italy. Some of the world's first purpose-built cruise liners, the Wilhelm Gustloff and the Robert Ley, were built to take KDF members on Mediterranean cruises. Other KDF programs included concerts, opera and other forms of entertainment in factories and other workplaces, free physical education and gymnastics training and coaching in sports such as football, tennis and sailing. All this was paid for by the DOF, at a cost of 29 million Reichsmarks a year by 1937, and ultimately by the workers themselves through their dues, although the employers also contributed. KDF was one of the Nazi regime's most popular programs, and played a large part in reconciling the working class to the regime, at least before 1939. The DOF and KDF's most ambitious program was the People's Car. The Volkswagen, originally a project undertaken at Hitler's request by the car maker Ferdinand Porsche. When the German car industry was unable to meet Hitler's demand that the Volkswagen be sold at 1,000 Reichsmarks or less, the project was taken over by the DOF. This brought Ley's old socialist tendencies back into prominence. The party, he said, had taken over where private industry had failed, because of the short-sightedness, malevolence, profiteering and stupidity of the business class. Now working for the DOF, Porsche built a new Volkswagen factory at Fallersleben, at a huge cost which was partly met by raiding the DAF's accumulated assets and misappropriating the dues paid by DOF members. The Volkswagen was sold to German workers on an installment plan, and the first models appeared in February 1939. The outbreak of war, however, meant that none of the 340,000 workers who paid for a car ever received one. The entire project was financially unsound, and only the corruption and lack of accountability of the Nazi regime made it possible. <laughs> <laughs> Wartime role Ley said in a speech in 1939, We National Socialists have monopolized all resources and all our energies during the past seven years so as to be able to be equipped for the supreme effort of battle." With the outbreak of World War II in September 1939, Ley's importance declined. The militarization of the workforce and the diversion of resources to the war greatly reduced the role of the DOF, and the KDF was largely curtailed. Ley's drunkenness and erratic behavior were less tolerated in wartime, and he was supplanted by armaments minister Fritz Tote and his successor Albert Speer as the Tsar of the German workforce the head of the organization Tote OT. As German workers were increasingly conscripted, foreign workers, first, guest workers, from France and later slave laborers from Poland, Ukraine and other eastern countries, were brought in to replace them. Ley played some role in this program, but was overshadowed by Fritz Sockel, General Plenipotentiary for the Distribution of Labor General für den in 1942. Nevertheless, Ley was deeply implicated in the mistreatment of foreign slave workers. In October 1942 he attended a meeting in Essen with Paul Plieger head of the giant Hermann Göring Works Industrial Combine and leaders of the German coal industry. A verbatim account of the meeting was kept by one of the managers. A recent historian writes, The key item on the agenda was the question of how to treat the Russians. Robert Ley, as usual, was drunk. And when Ley got drunk he was prone to speak his mind. 
With so much at stake, there was no room for compassion or civility. No degree of coercion was too much, and Lay expected the mine managers to back up their foreman in meting out the necessary discipline. As Lay put it, when a Russian pig has to be beaten, it would be the ordinary German worker who would have to do it. Despite his failings, Lay retained Hitler's favor. Until the last months of the war, he was part of Hitler's inner circle along with Martin Bormann and Joseph Goebbels. In November 1941, he was given a new role as Reich Commissioner for Social House Building, Reichskommissar für den Sozialen Wohnungsbau, later shortened to Reich Housing Commissioner, Reichswohnungskommissar. Here his job was to prepare for the effects on German housing of the expected Allied air attacks on German cities, which began to increase in intensity from 1941 onwards. In this role he became a key ally of armaments minister Albert Speer, who recognized that German workers must be adequately housed if productivity was to be maintained. As the air war against Germany increased from 1943, to housing. German workers became an objective of the Allied area bombing campaign, and Ley's organization was increasingly unable to cope with the resulting housing crisis. He was aware in general terms of the Nazi regime's program of extermination of the Jews of Europe. Ley encouraged it through the virulent antisemitism of his publications and speeches. In February 1941 he was present at a meeting along with Speer, Bormann and Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel at which Hitler had set out his views on the Jewish question, at some length, making it clear that he intended the disappearance of the Jews one way or another. In May 1944, Ley addressed a nationwide gathering of merchants in Passau. <laughs> Post war As Nazi Germany collapsed in early 1945, Ley was among the government figures who remained fanatically loyal to Hitler. He last saw Hitler on 20 April 1945, Hitler's birthday, in the Fearbunker in central Berlin. The next day he left for southern Bavaria, in the expectation that Hitler would make his last stand in the National Redoubt in the Alpine areas. When Hitler refused to leave Berlin, Ley was effectively unemployed. On 16 May he was captured by American paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division in a shoemaker's house in the village of Schlecking. Ley told them he was. Dr. Ernst de Stellmeyer, but he was identified by Franz Xaver Schwartz, the treasurer of the Nazi party and a longtime enemy. At the Nuremberg trials, Ley was indicted under Count 1, the common plan or conspiracy to wage an aggressive war in violation of international law or treaties. Count 3, war crimes, including among other things, mistreatment of prisoners of war or civilian populations, and Count 4. Crimes against humanity, murder, extermination, enslavement of civilian populations, persecution on the basis of racial, religions or political grounds." Lay was apparently indignant at being regarded as a war criminal, telling the American psychiatrist Douglas Kelly and psychologist Gustav Gilbert who had seen and tested him in prison, "...stand us against a wall and shoot us, well and good, you are victors." But why should I be brought before a tribunal like ACCC? I can't even get the word out." On 24 October, three days after receiving the indictment, Lay strangled himself in his prison cell using a noose made by tearing a towel into strips, fastened to the toilet pipe in his cell. See also Glossary of Nazi Germany List of Nazi Party leaders and officials Notes <laughs>